Okay, it is time for us to begin tonight, and uh, so thankful that uh, you're here for our summer series, Transformed by Praise. Tonight, Brother Corey Waddell, who preaches for the Bear Valley Church of Christ in uh, Denver, is our speaker, and uh, he is going to be covering Psalm 35, 2, 32, uh, a song, song of deliverance, and so we appreciate his willingness to be here with us this summer. Uh, Mark is going to lead us in an opening prayer, and then Corey will take over. Go to our Father in prayer. Our God, our Father in heaven, we are grateful for another opportunity to, to be in your presence, uh, to be able to uh, come before you uh, accepted uh, by you as, as your children. We're thankful, Father, for uh, the opportunity to uh, study a portion, uh, another portion of the word. We're especially grateful, Father, uh, to be able to have uh, brothers throughout uh, the local community that uh, serve you, that uh, are able to visit with us on Wednesday and, and bring us a portion of your word, bring us encouragement. We're grateful that to uh, uh, be able to get to know them or, or know them better as uh, this summer series continues. Uh, we're thankful, Father, uh, for your wisdom in instituting the church here on earth to so that we can have the fellowship and uh, encouragement uh, received from one another. We pray, Father, that uh, we can uh, encourage others uh, in this congregation to uh, uh, join us, uh, that they also can be uplifted uh, uh, by these lessons. We're grateful, Father, for your son Jesus, for the example that he give it, his, he's given to us, the, uh, the love that we have uh, through his sacrifice. This, this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening. We can try again. Good evening. All right, good. Making sure that I'm, that I'm on and everything's going. It is good to be with you all this evening. Greetings from, from Bear Valley over in Denver. Uh, it's neat to get to come up to Brighton. Uh, I think I came up here to buy a car uh, about a year and a half ago, so it's exciting to get to come up and spend a little bit more time around uh, and actually get to be w with some brothers and sisters. I'm looking forward to this, to this conversation tonight. It's... Uh, Psalm 32, there are elements of this psalm that have always been very, very uh, helpful for me. They've been among my favorites, uh, and, and I hope to maybe convey some of that, some of the excitement of that to you tonight. Uh, are you familiar with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? You, you may be. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle was the novelist who created the master detective Sherlock Holmes, and evidently he had a little bit of a penchant for... Uh, practical jokes. And there was one time that, the st as the story goes, uh, Doyle uh, wrote a telegram to 12 of his friends. They were all identical telegrams, and they all said the exact same thing. All has been discovered. Flee at once. And as the story goes, within 24 hours, all 12 men had fled the city. <laughs> Now, I don't know how true that is. I've found a couple of different versions of this story, but, you know, you, you see that and you kind of think to yourself, how would I respond if I got a letter in the mail that anonymous and it just said, I know what you're doing, you better get out of Dodge. What would that response be like? <laughs> would, would you get out of town? Because there's a fear 
that there's something going on in your life. Maybe there's this ongoing secret that you've been keeping that all of a sudden you were afraid somebody had actually found it out. I, I, don't, I would like to think that I don't have anything like that going on. I mean, it's, it's, but it's a good question to be able to ask. And if that is the case, it, it's very possible that within the group of us here tonight or those that may watch it online later, that you realize that if you got such a telegram, you'd be packing your bags and going out of town because there is actually some sort of secret that you are keeping, some sort of sin that is going on in your life or has happened in your life that no one else has known about to this point, but if it ever came out, heaven forbid, if it ever came out, it could do damage. And so as we begin this tonight, we're just going to kind of hit this thing head on. If that happens to be you, then I have good news. And Psalm 32 is going to help us find that good news. But before we can get to the good news, we have to come to grips with what we might call the bad news. The bad news is that it's not really a secret because you can't hide anything from God. God knows all that we've done. He knows everything that we've done in the daylight. He knows everything that we've done in the night. He knows everything that we've done in public. He knows everything that we've done in the secret of our bedrooms. We can't hide anything from God. And when we finally come to grips with that, with that reality, then, then what we begin to read in Psalm 32 is going to make a whole lot more sense to us. It's going to be of much greater value because of the weight that is carried from those secrets. Psalm 32, in, in a nutshell, is a psalm that, is, that poetically articulates the joy of forgiveness that comes from hidden sin. And it is believed to have been written by David after the Bathsheba debacle. Now, as I tell you that, maybe, maybe there might be a couple of you going, oh, wait a minute, Psalm 32. I thought Psalm 51 was the one that was written after the sin with, with Bathsheba, and you would be right. Uh, Psalm 51 very much is uh, one that we tie to those events, but Psalm 32 is a sequel to it. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means, uh, what I mean by that here in just a bit. But, you know, let, let's think for just a minute. If, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the story of David and Bathsheba, or even for those of us that are familiar, just, just a quick recap. The story of David and Bathsheba, it, it, it takes place in the time when David was at the pinnacle of, of his power. He was at the height of his power. He was at the prime of his life. And yet, for some reason, in that season of the year when kings go out to battle, that doesn't, make, that doesn't sound like something we would do uh, you know, nowadays, but back in that time, there was the time of year when, uh, when battles were going to take place. And so in that season of time, David, instead of going out to battle with his army, he chose to stay behind. And he sent the armies and the commanders out, and he foolishly stayed at home to relax. I mean, why not? I'm king. I can do that sort of thing. And it's a little bit of an arrogant, uh, arguably a little bit of an arrogant position to take. I can do what I want. I don't, I don't have to be involved in the way that I once was. And yet that arrogance, that moment of, of, of weak decision left him vulnerable to temptation. A temptation which came to fruition when he saw Bathsheba bathing on the roof of her house. From his balcony, he looked out and he could see her bathing on the roof of her house. And when he saw her, it stoked up a fire inside of him. And he wound up inviting her to the palace and they engaged in an adulterous affair which led to pregnancy. And then what we find is that it, this was really uh, the beginning of a free fall. Took David from adultery to conspiracy all the way to murder. And once it was all said and done, once Uriah, her husband, has been killed, David thinks he's gotten away with it. And so for the better part of a year, David is sitting back, deceiving himself in this self-deception, thinking that he'd gotten away with something. But the great king hit rock bottom 
when God confronted him through the prophet Nathan. You remember the bony finger? David, you are the man. See, that was always a compliment when I was growing up. Not so much in this case. And David finally, after months, confessed his sin out loud. We read in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. Now, that's the really short version that we get in 2 Samuel chapter 12. But in Psalm 51, David will give a much fuller expression of that confession, of that sorrow. This is just the way that he begins. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That's his response when finally confronted of the secret sin that he'd been holding on to in his life. So where does Psalm 32 fit in? Psalm 32, as I said before, is a sequel to the poem of confession in Psalm 51. And because they are, we, we tend to recognize them as being together, uh, uh, sister, sister psalms, if you will, the, we, we have a tendency to call both of them um, penitential psalms, penitence, being sorrow, and so both of them being the kind that, that would express that sorrow. But I think, I, I think, as I hope we'll be able to show you tonight, we can actually see that Psalm 32 is not a psalm of penitence. It's not a psalm of sorrow, please forgive me, but rather it is a song of praise for forgiveness that has already been received. You know, the bad news that we mentioned earlier is that you cannot hide anything from God. That's the recognition of Psalm 51. The good news of our sinful situation is to be found in Psalm 32, that God forgives the penitent heart even when that penitent heart has been hiding sin. And so tonight as we go down through this psalm, we're going to get a little bit of insight into the path, I guess, if you will, that David walked to get to the point that he could praise God after all of the pain that he had experienced from the sin that he had committed. And so if you don't have your Bibles open, please go ahead and open up. We're going to just jump right on in to, to Psalm 32. And as we do that, here's the encouragement that I want to give you all tonight. If there is anyone here online that is within the sound of my voice, anyone who is holding on to secret sin right now, listen to the words of this psalm. Because they can give you hope, and they can even give you a bit of a blueprint of sorts on how to deal with it. We begin in verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 32. He says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. You know, from the very get-go, it should be pretty easy. We realize that Psalm 32 is communicating a very different frame of mind than Psalm 51. Remember what he said in 51? It is a, you know, forgive me, O God. 51 is a plea for mercy needed. Psalm 32 begins with praise for the grace received. And he doesn't begin with this long list of, of faults and sins that he has committed, but rather he gives a statement of how wonderful it is to be accepted by God's grace. But what I love about this opening beatitude is really what it is. It's very much like the beatitudes of Jesus' Sermon on the, on the Mount. Blessed is the one, right? And what I love about this beatitude is the way that he describes that complete coverage of God's grace and forgiveness. That it covers every type and every, every angle of sin that can be in our lives. For, for example, you know, pay, pay attention to the sin words 
that we have in this text, in, in just in these few verses. Transgression, sin, iniquity, deceit. They all kind of give you a, a little bit of a nuance about the type of sin or the way that sin can occur in our lives. The word transgression is, is literally a crossing of the line. So God draws the line in the sand and says, don't cross that line, and we hop over. And so it is that crossing of a line. It is of a line. It is rebelling against God. And you think about David. David would have very much been uh, familiar with the law of God. He would have known the Ten Commandments. He knows what God's expectation is. And so thus, he would have understood that adultery, murder, and deceit were all forbidden. And yet, what had he done? He had crossed that line. But we also get the word sin. Uh, th this is that term, maybe you've heard it said before, the word sin means to miss the mark. I always envision the idea of, of an archer or someone who's, uh, who's shooting a, a rifle, but you, you imagine drawing back with the archery, with the bow, and, and the goal is to hit the dead center of that target, right? But you draw back and you let it fly and you miss your mark. That's what it means to sin. God has set standards. He has set marks that we are aiming for in order to, to be living righteously. And so to sin is when we don't live up to the standards that God has set. And that goes beyond just simply transgressing a line in the sand. Uh, we get to passages, uh, James, I believe it's chapter 2, verse 10, or maybe it's chapter 3, verse 10. He makes the statement, to the one who knows the good to do but fails to do it, he has sinned. When you know the right thing to do and you just simply don't do it, you've missed the mark. And we could go into a deeper study on that for, at another time. But then we get this word iniquity. The word iniquity means twisted. To, to take and bend it out of its meant or original or intended shape. It describes what happens to the inner character of the sinner. When sin is present, and as we think about hidden sin, it twists and manipulates our character into something that is not godly. And then we get the idea of deceit, which is deception. Uh, you know, David tried to cover up his sins. He tried to pretend that what he had done had not actually happened. Or maybe he had justified it in his own mind. And he tried to manipulate that around and deceive himself into thinking that what had happened was okay some way, somehow. These are the sin words of verses 1 and 2, but this is a praise. So therefore, what we also find are the grace terms that go along with it. He, began, he uses the word forgiven. The word forgiven means to, to have a burden lifted. Or sometimes the way that I've described it is if you imagine holding on, the word to, to forgive is to hold it and to let go. And so when God forgives. He is taking that burden that we have and he is letting it go or he is releasing it from off of us. So it is no longer something that we are carrying around. And then he talks about the idea that, that the sin is covered, which is interesting that David would use this term because David tried to cover his sins with his own deceit, but his schemes did not work. Our schemes never work when we try to cover our sins. And yet, when God covers the sins that we confess to Him, it takes on a different meaning. Now they are truly hidden from His sight, never to be seen again. And then we get the word counts. Or depending upon your, your translation, you might see the word um, imputes. This is a bookkeeping term. It's one of my absolute favorite terms in all of Scripture because of the way that it gets applied to the idea of sin being forgiven. And it's a bookkeeping term that means to put onto your account, to put onto your record. And notice how he phrases it. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. When we confess our sins... When we have the kind of penitent heart that David is going to show, what, what the Bible goes on, and Paul will expound upon this even more, in, in, particularly in Romans chapter 4 and in a couple of his other letters, 
He says, blessed, he actually kind of tweaks the phrasing when he quotes Psalm 32. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And so there's the idea that, that there's that person out there that when they sin, it, it's, it's being stricken from the record. The sin that we've committed is, is not going down on the permanent roster or, or the permanent record sheet. That's grace. That's exciting. And so as we go forward, what we need to understand is that this is what David had experienced. Psalm 51, please God forgive me. Psalm 32, you have forgiven me. Let me extol you for what I am now feeling, from what I am now uh, am living out. And the thing about it is that as you look at these, at these verses, whatever it is that David experienced through the grace and forgiveness of God, we can experience that too. We can experience the all-encompassing forgiveness that God is offering through His grace. But as we've already hinted, David was not always in that state of joy. He had been in a very, very different frame of mind at another point. And this is where verses 3 and 4 come into play because they begin to, they, he kind of reflects back on what it was like before the forgiveness came. Notice what he says. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. This is what happens when sin is kept contained and secret inside of us. Did you know that neuroscientists have found evidence that keeping a bad secret is actually damaging to your mental health? The reason why is because holding on to those secrets puts them... Uh, puts the brain, rather, in, a, in this awkward, compromised position. There's a part of your brain that's been nicknamed the logical lobe. I don't know where on the brain it is, but it's nicknamed the logical lobe. And it is actually wired by God to tell the truth. It plays a huge role in emotional responses that we have. But when we keep a secret locked inside, what we're doing is we're, we're not allowing that portion of our brain to do what it was created to do, to perform its, its natural functions. And so what winds up happening is that particular cortex of the brain becomes stressed. And it's frustrated. And it's trying to do what God created it to do, but it can't. And when that part, when the logical lobe becomes stressed, another part of your brain, also used in decision-making and complex thought and deception, begins to kick in. And that second part of your brain starts playing out all of the bad scenarios that could happen if your secret ever came to light. Now, start putting that together. Because all of a sudden, these two areas of your brain are now at odds with one another. One wants to tell the truth, and the other was trying really, really hard not to do so because of all the bad things that might happen. And that results in our stress level going sky high. And what happens when we have chronic stress in our life for too long? Not good things as far as our health is concerned all because we are hiding a secret down inside of us. David's affair with Bathsheba was not just a terrible failure. It was. But it was a secret that he kept from everyone, except the Lord, and he tried to cover up any evidence of it. And, for hap and, and again, for the better part of a year, David kept that pressure of that unconfessed sin locked inside of him. And he experienced some very real effects of that. Notice again what he says in 3 and 4. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up like the heat of summer. The idea that he, he felt like God's hand was heavy and pressing down upon him like a weight upon his chest. And the phrase, my bones wasted away, is literally, my, uh, my bones became brittle. 
Have you ever been so stressed out that you felt like you aged a whole lot faster than you should have? I know I have. Getting stressed out and I get to the end of it and I'm going, man, I feel like 5, 10 years, 15 years older than I was when all of this started. And that's kind of the way that David is describing this. One commentator even went so far as to suggest that basically David felt like the Lord was trying to kill him from the guilt. And this, was the, this is what guilt before God can feel like when we're leaving that all bottled up inside of us. The burden just keeps getting heavier and heavier and heavier as time goes on. But then in verse 5, the release finally happens. He rounds a corner and things begin to change. Verse 5, David writes, I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. David finally learned the secret that the secret needed to be let out into the open. He didn't need to keep it covered up inside. Confession is one of the most healing practices that we can ever engage in. American psychologist William James once commented, For him who confesses, shames are over and realities have begun. I think it's a pretty good insight. Because the truth is we even have that found it with that principle found within scripture in 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 the apostle John writes if we confess our sins he that is god is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness the shames are over and the realities begin and yet confession is also a a drastic measure because it brings secret things to light. And we don't like that. That often goes against our impulses. I want to keep this hidden. I don't want to go through the shame and the embarrassment. But I want you to think about the word confess. The word confess means to say the same thing. Now, I, I've always thought that was an odd definition of the word confess in Scripture, to say the same thing. But you think about it, what winds up happening is that true confession means that we are saying the same thing about sin that God is saying about sin. Sin is repulsive. Sin is damaging. Sin is deadly. Thus, true confession is also recognized by the fact that we are repulsed by our own actions. If I think the same thing about it as God does. But it's really key that we realize that it is a repulsion on our part. You see, the thing is, is too many people, and I, and I would suggest, sadly, even among Christians, too many people have never learned to see the ugliness of sin especially when compared to the holiness of God. We pray generic or even flippant prayers that are filled with, with platitudes and cliched phrases. Lord, forgive us of the sins. And it's like a rinse and repeat. Or it's like hitting the, the repeat button on the old CD players. You remember those? Long time ago, CD players. Yeah, you hit the repeat button and you could just see the same thing over and over. Sometimes it feels like in our prayers, uh, why are we even bothering opening up our mouths? Let's just record it. Let's just put it a CD in because we always say the same thing. Platitudes, cliches. And the thing is, if we look back on the sins in our lives and there's a part of us that really kind of enjoys thinking about it, we kind of think back fondly and pleasantly reliving those moments in our imaginations, and the truth is we haven't learned to confess anything before God because we're not repulsed by the sin. Which also leads us to understand that true confession is not just a matter of the lips. 
it's not just saying an obligatory, I'm sorry, just so someone will get off your back. It comes from a sincere, genuinely regretful heart. If I could reference back to Psalm 51 for a moment, in Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17, you get that true repentance coming out from David's pen, okay, as it were in this case, but he says, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, that you will not despise. I've noticed through the years that people often have, a, have adopted a pay-it-back mentality in which we conclude that, that I can somehow make amends for my sins by attending one more assembly, by putting a few extra dollars in the plate, by reading my Bible an extra 15 minutes, or promising that I'm just never going to do it again. And just by doing those actions, that somehow those things make up for the fact that I did the wrong earlier or that I committed the sin earlier. But that just isn't the case. Aside from the fact that good deeds never outweigh one single bad deed. You ever thought about that? You put the balance scale in place. If you have one wicked, sinful deed over here, you will never do enough good things to outweigh the sin in your life. Aside from that fact, as we heard David articulate in Psalm 51, God is not nearly as interested in your offerings as He is interested in your heart being truly turned to Him when you confess sins. The contrite heart is what God wants. And this is what true confession understands. And it's what David learned was a necessary part of dealing with the sin in his life. And it's what we too must understand is necessary when we fall on our walk with him. But having found that turning point, David saying, I, I now have confessed my sin and you forgave my iniquity, you forgave my trespasses. Having found that turning point, as we keep on reading in Psalm 32, we see that David can now encourage and issue praise for God's response to his confession. Look at verses 6 and 7. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. You know, we come into these verses, and, the, and maybe the first thing that you, you should notice is that he encourages readers to pray to God and to lift that sin. Prayer is the medium of our confession. It is when we invoke God's mercy and grace and forgiveness. And the, and the notions of confession and prayer are inextricably linked. You, you cannot separate the two from one another. Even when we're confessing our sins to, to other Christians, the two go together. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. For the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And so as we come to 6 and 7, what, what I want you to notice is that in these verses, as, as David writes out about the, the, um, the response that God had to his genuine confession, what we find here is that there is a huge amount of power. What is that power that James talks about behind a genuine confession prayer? First, we find right there in... Uh, Verse 6, the first part of verse 6 is that God can be found. So then let everyone who is godly offer prayer at a time when you may be found. God can be located. Sometimes in the dark pits of hidden sin, we wonder if the Lord is even listening. 
if I were to call out. There are times when people have said, God is just so far away from me. I just feel so separated from him. Listen to the words of David. Pray and God can be found. He is waiting for you to open up. He hasn't gone anywhere. We are the ones who may stray. But then we also find that not only can God be found, but we find that God's protection is found. Or you may say God's salvation is found in confession. Second part of verse 6, he talks about um, that surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. It's interesting throughout the Psalms, sometimes go do a little search on the idea of rushing waters in the Psalms. And it appears several times throughout the writings. And, and what it typically means or references is when somebody is, it's an allusion to personal distress. They have the wadis, which are canyons over in that part of the world. And so what, what will happen a lot of times, they're dry for large chunks of the year. But when those times come that there is rain that falls, there, there are stories of, of, of livestock that have wandered down into the wadis or sometimes even people who have wandered down into the wadis. And a storm 35 miles away dumps water on top of a mountain and it sends it rushing down through those canyons. And before you know it, you are covered up with torrents of water that have come down off the mountains. That's panic in your heart. And the vision here is, is he says that God has reached in and he has lifted me above the torrent and he has placed me on top of the solid rock away from that which would drown me and cover me up. But then we also see in 7a that he preserves us uh, in a hiding place from evil. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. So not only has he picked us up away from the trouble, but now he has shielded us. And he's placed us in that cleft of the rock. And he's protecting us from the trouble that would come. But as we look at these verses, I, I think it's also neat, and I think it's e maybe even necessary to notice how a, a prayer of confession has turned David to an absolute 180 from where he was before. I want you to look at the differences between verses 3 and 4 and verses 6 and 7. In verse 3, he says, I kept silent. I would not open my mouth about this sin. And yet in verse 6, what's happening? I am opening my mouth. I am praying to you. And I'm encouraging every reader that gets their hands on this to pray before God. In verse 4, he talks about how God's hand was heavy upon him, pressing him down under the weight of that sin. And yet in verse 6, now God's hand is not heavy. God's hand is lifting and pulling him out of the abyss. In verse 3, he was hiding from God. I kept silent. My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. He was trying to stay away from God. And yet, in verse 7, now he is hidden by God, protected from the dangers of life, the dangers that may accompany the temptations and sin. And then in verse 4, he, he, he talks about how my strength was dried up. I had no energy. I was wasting away from the inside out, being eaten alive. And yet in verse 7, he is now energized to be able to celebrate. If you will, he can now go join the party because he's had that infusion of joy that had been taken away when he was hiding the sin deep inside. And with so much being offered by God, why wouldn't you take advantage of that? Why would anybody turn this down and keep over here in verses 3 and 4 when you could have 6 and 7? But realizing what happens, realizing the things that we get from that prayer of confession from God, that brings us to verses 8 and 9, which is the instruction that follows. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Now, there's some interesting debate 
uh, there's some interesting debate over who I is in, in verse uh, 8. There's really two options. The I of verse 8 could be God. It's not uncommon in, in Hebrew poetry that when there is a praise given for God's action, that an oracle from God will follow, instruction from Him. So it's possible that it's God is the I who's speaking here, but it's also possible that it's the psalmist. That in light of all the good things that, that God has done, now he's going to take it upon himself to bring instruction to those who would listen to him, to bring a warning for other followers of Yahweh to not go down the path that he went down, or if they are in it, then, then to heed his advice and to, and to mimic or imitate his life. But either way, whether you think it's God or whether you think it's the psalmist, the message is the same. Don't be a wild, stubborn mule. That's the message. Don't be so stubborn that you can't see where your master's leading you, that you refuse to go where the one who cares for you is leading you and wants you to go. I liked this assessment of verses 8 and 9. It came out of, uh, out of a commentary. The authors said, A trained animal has to learn to accept bit and bridle so that animal and human can work together. Without it, the animal can run unrestrained, and often that animal will run into trouble. We too then must learn the path to happiness through responsibility and learning from others. We learn from other Christians who have walked paths that we haven't walked or who have insights that we don't have. We learn from the Word of God first and foremost. We allow, when we allow ourselves to submit to that teaching, when we allow ourselves to be led, controlled by that teaching, then we go in the places where, as he says in Psalm 23, we will be fed by quiet waters. We will have everything that we need. But then we get to verses 10 and 11. A final praise. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. As he closes out the psalm of praise, David uh, waxes a bit proverbial here in verse 10. The idea that many are the sorrows of the way. It sounds very much like something you would read in Solomon's Proverbs. But pay attention to the message. The weight of the wicked's sin holds them down. But true happiness, true joy, true life is only found in Yahweh God who forgives and redeems and restores His people. And when you think about it, kind of hinted at this already, would you rather drag around all of your sorrows every day? Or would you rather be surrounded at all times by God's steadfast love and joy? There hardly seems to be a choice at all. And yet, it is a choice that we must make. Because the temptation that we all have is to hold on to our secret sins. To keep them inside because we fear that, that we won't be accepted if it comes out or we fear that we're not going to be loved if we ever let people know that we, that we had this indiscretion. And we don't like embarrassment. We don't like saying that we did something wrong. And yet confession is the only way to lift the load that lets God's grace take over. And it is the path, it is the path to praising God after sin in our lives. Thank you. Will you join me in a word of prayer as we're dismissed? <clears throat> For Almighty God in heaven, we're so grateful to you that you are a God and that you are a loving God. That even though, Father, we 
often fail you, that you hold out forgiveness to us. We pray, Father, that we might have hearts of humility before you, that we might always be eager to submit ourselves to your will and yield our own. Father, we thank you for the grace that you offer to us, the mercy that you extend. But Father, we pray that we might prepare ourselves as we face temptation, that we might rely upon the instructions in your revelation, that we might not sin against you so that the forgiveness that we need might be less and less as our strength is improved and our trust in you grows. But Father, we rejoice in the salvation that you offer us, and we pray, Father, that we might always appreciate that, appreciate the fact that your Son paid the price for that forgiveness, that we might not take it lightly, but see sin as you see it and strive to eradicate it from our lives. Thank you for your continued blessings upon us, and help us always to live faithfully before you. We pray in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen.